Anyo Haseo. My name is Katsuko Hasegawa. I'm the actual uh, president of SCAJ, uh, Specialty Coffee Associ Association of Japan. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm the president of SCJ, but also uh, president of uh, Roaster called Cafe Paulista. I'm a Japanese roaster. I would like to uh, begin my presentation explaining how the uh, coffee industry started in Japan. It's not about specialty coffee, but uh, coffee itself started in Japan. Our founder is a man called Ryo Mizuno. He's called the father of Japanese immigrants. In 1908, the first Japanese immigrants to Brazil. But why Japanese immigrants went to Brazil in 1908? Because in 1850, Brazil abolishes slave trade. Brazil was a huge uh, coffee producing country. But all the coffee plantations, they used black slaves, uh, which was taken from Africa, to work in a uh, fazenda, a uh, coffee plantation. But Brazil decided to abolish first uh, slave trade in 1850. Then, in 1888, so-called the Golden Law, so Brazil abolishes, abolished slavery uh, totally. So what happened was that at that time, uh, coffee industry in Brazil, coffee plantation, is growing very rapidly. But uh, because they abolished slave system, there was uh, nobody working in a coffee plantation. So there was a severe uh, lack of uh, labor in coffee plantations. shortage of manual labor in coffee plantations. So they decided, I mean the fazenderos, the owner of coffee plantation, decided to have uh, immigrants coming to Brazil from com uh, countries like Germany, Swiss, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. especially Italians. More than 20,000 immigrants from Italy uh, went to Brazil. But the problem is that uh, the fazenderos, the owners of uh, coffee plantations, it wasn't easy for them to change their way of uh, thinking because they had relied uh, heavily on uh, black slaves labor, uh, when these Italian immigrants or other nations came, they treated these uh, immigrants as if they were slaves. So these people, these immigrants who worked in coffee plantations in Brazil, uh, they are supposed to be paid workers. But sometimes they were not paid, and other times uh, they get paid, but they are forced to live in uh, uh, plantations, inside plantations. And uh, there is a, only one shop where they can buy necessities. And the product that they can buy there is very uh, expensive. So that uh, even when they uh, get salary, they have to pay you know, expensive prices to buy uh, daily necessities so that they, uh, they didn't really earn any money. 
so what happened was that the, looking at these uh, situations, the Italian government was very upset. And uh, they banned the Italian immigrant, immigration to Brazil. And afterward, the Spanish governments did the same thing. They also banned Spanish immigrant immigration to Brazil. So uh, from Europe, nobody is coming. No Italian, no Spanish, nobody. At first, Brazilian people uh, had a certain reservation about accepting immigrants from Asia, like Chinese, Co uh, Korean, Japanese, but they had no choice. So they started to have uh, the first Japanese immigrants to Brazil in 1908. And our founder, Mizuno, because uh, he was seeing that the other time, Japan was a very poor country. So there are many poor people in Japan. And these people want to go to Brazil to earn some money. So when uh, Mizuno recruited, recruited immigrants, 165 families, total 781 people came. And they went to Brazil in that ship, a famous ship called Casa do Maru. And Japanese immigrants worked in coffee plantations. And uh, at that time, Brazil had the share of more than 50% of whole world coffee production. And uh, in 1895, the price of coffee dropped like a 40%. So because uh, Brazil was a huge producer of coffee, when they make too much coffee, there's always risk of uh, the price of coffee dropping. So what they, they did was a uh, convenio de taubate. Convenio uh, in the Portuguese language means agreement. So it's a taubate agreement. What is taubate agreement? Taubate agreement is the head of uh, Sao Paulo State, uh, head of uh, Minas Gerais, head of uh, Rio de Janeiro, they gathered in a small town called uh, Taubate and uh, discussed about, discussed how do they deal with uh, this uh, overproduction and the consequent uh, downfall of price. And uh, they decided not to sell their coffee. This is all Portuguese. But uh, uh, 1906, 26 February, uh, February 26, they decided for the first time retention of coffee, retenção do café. So they put all the coffee, which was uh, surplus, in the warehouse and uh, they keep it there, not to sell, in, in order for the price not to go down. This is a very interesting historical event because when Brazilians was keeping this uh, surplus coffee in a warehouse, they started to think about how they can utilize, how they can the best, make the best use of this surplus coffee. And uh, they decided to talk to Mizuno, who was the head of uh, Japanese immigrants, to give him uh, coffee for free, for him to bring the coffee, this surplus coffee, to Japan 
to open the new market for the Brazilian coffee. This is called free coffee, and it started from 1912 and 1923. For 12 years, each year Mizuno had received 1,000 bags of the free coffee, total 846,000 kilos of the free coffee. The objective to open new market for Brazilian coffee. But when Mizuno came back from Brazil to Japan and uh, he received this free coffee, and uh, Mizuno was very excited because for him, this coffee, Brazilian coffee, was cultivated, you know, uh, taken care of, taken care of by Japanese immigrants whom he brought to Brazil. So for him, uh, this coffee is not, not just Brazilian coffee, but like half Japanese coffee, because Japanese workers were, you know, uh, making it. So he was, uh, he felt kind of uh, obligation to sell this coffee to Japanese uh, consumers. He thought that uh, uh, it was like a, his duty to let the Japanese population, people, to know what is Brazilian coffee. But actually, it was almost impossible for him to sell coffee in Japan. Because at that time, nobody knew coffee. All the, all the Japanese people were drinking green tea. And nobody saw, you know, this black liquid. So when uh, Mizuno tried to sell coffee to Japanese people, they all said that, uh, what is this black thing so bitter? I mean, can you, you know, drink it? So it was very, very difficult for Mizuno to sell. He went to uh, hotels, he went to restaurants, he went to uh, uh, wholesale food companies, but uh, everybody said no to Mizuno to buy coffee. So he got desperate, and uh, he talked, he, uh, this uh, Okuma Shigenobu is a friend of Mizuno. He's a founder of uh, Waseda University in Tokyo. And uh, he's intelligent, so Mizuno consulted with uh, Okuma, and Okuma said, Mizuno, you have to study, you have to look at how Europeans are drinking coffee. You have to go to Europe to see how coffee is taken, how people are taking coffee. So Mizuno sent two of his employees to Paris, France. And at that time, in, in Paris, the cafe called Rue Procope is the most popular cafe uh, in Paris. And the two of his employees went there, drank coffee, how Europeans are taking coffee, so learned uh, how coffee is sold to French people. And these uh, two employees of Mizuno came back to Japan, came back to Tokyo, and with Mizuno, built the first coffee house in Ginza, Tokyo, which is called Ginza Cafe Paulista. In 1911, December 12th, the cafe was open, and it was a huge success. It's a two floors a coffee shop. This is the second floor. So you can see that the the interior is a kind of French style because they had the influence of uh, Procope in Paris. And also he started to advertisement in newspapers. This is a Café Paulista advertisement. The interesting thing about uh, Café Paulista is that all the garçons are male boys. There was no women. 
because it comes from a French cafe. So Mizuno uh, took on this uh, French custom of using only male garçon in Cafe Paulista. This is all another uh, advertisement of uh, Cafe Paulista. It's in Japanese. It's a, it, it says that the Brazilian coffee, in canned Brazilian coffee. And this is a replica of a first canned ground uh, Brazilian coffee, which was sold by Cafe Paulista. You can see here that uh, it's written Cafe de São Paulo. Because cafe, uh, cafe paulista in Portuguese means it's adjective of uh, uh, the state of São Paulo. So cafe paulista means coffee from uh, São Paulo state. And uh, Mizuno built 20 shops all over Japan. This is the first T Ford truck they use to deliver uh, coffee to customers. And in 1947, Kazue Hasegawa, he's my grandfather, he became the new president of Cafe Paulista. Because Mizuno, he went back to Brazil. His passion was more with uh, Japanese immigrants than the coffee. And my grandfather was a, a roaster, technician, roast master of Cafe Paulista. And after Mizuno left the Cafe Paulista to my grandfather, he co continued with the Cafe Paulista. This is our roasting factory now. So it's been uh, the beginning, the <laughs> story about the beginning of the uh, uh, coffee industry in Japan. Now I would like to start speaking about specialty coffee market in Japan and how it started. The first Starbucks in Japan, Starbucks opened their first shop in Ginza in August 1996. But for us, for Japanese roasters, it wasn't such a big thing, big shock. Because before they opened their first shop, we had been visiting Seattle to see the uh, Starbucks. So we knew how you know, they operate, what kind of a coffee shop uh, they make. So for us, it's not such a, a big thing that the Starbucks came to Japan. For us, what, is, what was the big thing was this uh, project, development of Gourmet Coffee Potential Project. Uh, it was done by International Tra Trade Center, uh, ITC. This is an organization, a part of uh, UNCTAD, United Nations. And, uh, also, International Coffee Organization, ICO. We had this project in 1997. In this project, participated five countries. One is Papua New Guinea, the other one is Ethiopia, third is uh, Burundi, fourth is Uga Uga Uganda, and the fifth is uh, Brazil. The purpose of this project was that uh, when United Nations see the so-called underdeveloped countries, uh, poor countries, they are all coffee-producing countries. So in order for them to gain more um, income, more uh, value. United Nations thought that uh, uh, something should be done about it. And the purpose of uh, 
this project was to uh, create a system where this country can add more value to their coffee. And also, uh, even when they make a, you know, a specialty coffee, a very high quality coffee, when this coffee imported to consuming countries like, like Japan, if roasters mix this coffee with a, a cheap coffee, it doesn't make any sense. So at the same time that uh, they are teaching the producers in this country how to add value to their coffee, they also ask uh, roasters in consuming countries how we can market this new, uh, what they call, gourmet coffee. So from Japan, uh, many roasters participated in this project. And uh, they chose a kind of a consultant to go between producing countries and uh, uh, roasters in consuming countries. From Japan, uh, Mr. Hayashi was a consultant. I believe from the United States, uh, Mr. George Howell was a, a consultant. The object of uh, this pro project was uh, to develop high quality coffee in participating countries to verify the quality required by consuming countries and its cost. For producers to understand the quality required by consuming countries, And for us, for roasters in consuming countries, to understand what kind of measures are taken to better the quality of coffees and what kind of coffees are being produced. From Papua New Guinea, we received uh, Morobe coffee, Wagivare, and the Simbu coffee, which was very interesting for us. Because before this project, the only Papua New Guinea uh, coffee we knew of uh, was a Siguri, Papua New Guinea coffee. No, uh, you know, we didn't know any other coffee from Papua New Guinea. From Uganda, uh, Mount Ergon. From Ethiopia, Mount Weru, Delgago, Buri, Limu. From Brazilian, uh, da terra. From Burundi, Ngoma. It was by OSIB. OSIB is an organization which controls the quality of coffee. And we also had the visitors in 1999 from Papua New Guinea, Miss Patricia Honor and Mr. David Rumba And from Ethiopia, the president of uh, Murunekaka uh, Export, Mr. Murunekaka, came. And uh, with them, we had uh, uh, many discussions about how we can uh, collaborate each other in promoting this uh, new gourmet coffee. Because at that time, the New York price was the lowest. In the, in, it's like uh, 41.50 uh, cents per pound. So it was a very difficult time for producers. And uh, the object of this uh, gourmet coffee project was to make the coffee production sustainable. Because obviously, with a price 45 cents per pound, nobody's, no producer is uh, sustainable. No, no one can reproduce. So at that time, with uh, these uh, producers from participating countries, we talked a lot about uh, floor price, or ceiling price, or fixed price. Floor price is obvious. 
when coffee price goes down to uh, like a 45, nobody can reproduce. So producers and uh, roasters should set the floor price. They said 120. When the price goes down below the 120, we should stop you know, asking uh, this price to the producer. But we should stop at the 120. So we pay 120 to the producer. This is an uh, idea of a floor price. Ceiling price is that uh, roasters tend to ask producers when they set floor price, they should set the ceiling price. <laughs> but actually, I've never seen ceiling price. Because for roasters, we can always you know, raise our ceiling price. So even when the price goes up like a 300, uh, for roasters, I mean, compared with the producers, it's relatively uh, easy to escape. For producers, when New York City price goes down like a 45, there is no escape. They can't do anything about it. And uh, the last one, fixed price. It's not really fixed. But the idea is that uh, why do we care about, why we give so much uh, importance to New York price? Because New York price, New York future price, you know, goes up and down like a roller coaster. But producers and roasters, why do we have, do we have to care about this uh, uh, New York Sea? When uh, I buy my coffee from this certain producer, it's the business is between him and me. So he has his own cost of making coffee, and I have my own cost. So that uh, we can be free from uh, New York City price. We can decide between ourselves uh, how the price should be. And I think that uh, this idea, when we move from this uh, conventional coffee thinking to specialty coffee, this uh, idea of uh, uh, more or less fixed price is, uh, I think I see it uh, much more now than before. And in the project, as a roaster in consuming countries, we had to think about how do we market this uh, specialty coffee, the gourmet coffee. Because these five countries, they are sending uh, coffee to, to us. And just like Mizuno, our founder, I have to sell it. And uh, at that time, we had been uh, selling only, most of our coffee was uh, conventional coffee. So I had to you know, develop a totally new marketing to sell this uh, uh, gourmet coffee. How do we find new customers for specialty coffee? And at that point, I came to realize the most important job of a roaster is not, not roasting coffee. I mean, roasting coffee is, roasting coffee is very important. You know, there are many techniques. There are many uh, way, ways of uh, roasting coffee. It, is, it has the significant importance. But then, uh, roasters has to market the coffee, especially when it comes to a new kind of coffee, like a specialty coffee. We have to find, we have to develop new marketing uh, way of uh, selling it. So I thought that the most important work of a roaster is marketing. So looking back from now to this day of uh, Gourmet Coffee Project, 
I think that the, the, all the basic ideas of specialty coffee were in the project. Because before uh, this gourmet coffee project, when you buy and sell commercial coffee, coffee producers didn't have any faith. I mean, me uh, at my uh, office, I telephone to uh, green dealers and ask, how much is uh, Santos number two? How much is uh, Colombia Excelso? And they give me a price, and uh, I telephone to other uh, green bean brokers and ask the price, compare, uh, qu compare quality. Uh, they give us a sample, so we cut the sample and uh, compare the quality and price, and buy the coffee from uh, the, the green dealer who has the cheapest price and the, the best quality. So at that time, we didn't care who other you know, producers were. But from that moment, uh, we started with uh, this gourmet coffee project. Coffee producers began to have faces. And our business has become personal between you and your producer. In the morning, they talked about the direct trade. When we moved to uh, direct trade, we started buying directly from uh, producers. So the business became very personal. I visit, I visit uh, producing countries and meet the produce, producers, meet the family of the producers, meet the relatives of the producers, <laughs> meet everybody. So business got very personal. And uh, it's not just a quality and price, but uh, it's a, it became like a whole you know, relationship. So I feel that the, the coffee industry, specialty coffee industry I'm in right now, is totally different from the industry I had been when I, we had only dealt with a conventional coffee. In specialty coffee, we talk about from seed to cup. It's really true that uh, the whole process of producing coffee, we have to be uh, in that uh, process. Oh, this one. And the cup of excellence. The beginning of uh, Cup of Excellence competition and auction was when uh, Brazil uh, terminated the Gourmet Coffee project. They started the first auction, uh, uh, first competition and auction at the Lavras University in Brazil in 1999, and they had developed a couple of Excellence. And in 2003, we have founded the SCAJ, Special, Specialty Coffee Association of Japan. And uh, it's been 10 years. 2004, first ex exhibition. 2006, first independence, independent exhibition. And uh, we had the WBC, 2007, in Tokyo. And uh, 2010, barista Miss Haruna Murakami won uh, WLAC. And Federación de Colombia gave us a medalla, Al Merito Cafetero, Manuel Mejia. And uh, 2012 was the 10th anniversary, anniversary. And last, uh, no, this year, no, this year, barista Hidenori Izaki won WBC in Rimini, uh, in Italy. So it's been 10 years. Now I would like to explain how is it specialty coffee market in Japan. 
last year, we did uh, market research uh, of uh, specialty coffee in the SCJ. The question is, will it grow in the next 10 years? This is uh, USDA 2014 July report. Europe, United States, Japan, all traditional consuming uh, countries, and the five-year average growth rate, when you look at it, Europe is uh, 2%, United States 2.7%, Japan 3.1%. So actually, Japan's uh, consumption, importation, is growing. Two thousand thirteen, total coffee import was about four hundred fifty thousand tons in Japan, and we have found out from the research that the specialty coffee import, roughly 27,000 tons. So the specialty coffee import of Japan was 6% of Japan's total coffee import. And when, when uh, these numbers uh, we get, it's not this term, specialty coffee, is not like a certified coffee. It's based on uh, cupping points of SCAA, COE, or SCAJ cupping forms. So it's not just that, uh, you know, sometimes when you get figures, uh, you ask, do you, do you buy specialty coffee? They reply, like, uh, they buy organic coffee, or they, they buy fair trade coffee. But it's, uh, our question was, Based on cupping points, uh, how many bags of specialty coffee do you buy? And the result was a 6%. And also, the interesting uh, result of uh, our research was that uh, when we asked the members of uh, SCAG, Specialty Coffee Association of Japan, who is the target consumer group? Or uh, who is buying most? Uh, specialty coffee from you. They, they replied that um, senior citizens are buying specialty coffee. In Japan, when we say senior citizens, it means that uh, somebody above 65 years old. But why senior citizens buy the specialty coffee? It's because in Japan, senior citizens have the most assets. I mean, they are retired, but they have uh, assets. You know, they are. Uh, they don't. They don't say it, but they are very well off. And also, senior citizens have a lot of time to prepare specialty coffee at home. Another thing which was interesting for us is that uh, uh, from the report, from the um, survey, the home, home, home con consumption of specialty coffee is growing. So many Japanese specialty coffee roasters are selling uh, to the home use, home consumption in Japan. So, Combined, senior citizens are consuming a lot of coffee at home. I think it's, uh, when I think about it, we had a kissatense boom from 1960 to 1980. In this morning, that the uh, they ha you have you had the uh, certain boom also in Korea, but before 
we had a lot of kissatens, which are individual coffee shops in, in Japan. And they pre prepared coffee like a vacuum, like a siphon. Or many, you know, um, different uh, way of prepar preparation. At its peak, the number of kissatens in Japan reached 100. 54,630. So there were many uh, kissatens. I remember when I was a like, uh, junior high school student, I went to uh, kissatens. I, was, I wasn't allowed to go to kissatens. Kissatens was some, somewhere, you know, grown up school. And uh, I remember that uh, I saw that, you know, siphon way of making coffee, vacuum. Coffee, you know, goes up and down. It's like a magic. So I was fascinated. So that senior citizens, uh, somebody who is uh, above 65, they spent a lot of time in Kisatens when they were young. The only difference is that uh, at that time, they had no specialty coffee, just conventional coffee. But these people, th these consumers have a... Uh, liking for coffee. Everyone says that uh, in Japan, the total coffee, uh, total population is decreasing, which is, is uh, bad news for Japanese economy. But as far as specialty coffee is concerned, I am very optimistic. Because we are selling a lot of uh, specialty coffee to home consumption of uh, senior citizens. And there, there are a huge population of uh, senior citizens. The baby boomers born in 1947 to 1949, the number of babies born at that time was uh, more than 2 million for three cons consecutive years. And also, we had the second baby boomers, which is uh, sons and daughters of uh, baby boomers. And this number, more than uh, two million, they are all also huge population. This is the uh, age distribution in 2010. So it's uh, four years ago. First baby boomer is uh, just becoming 65. And second baby boomer, 38. And uh, this is the uh, age distribution in 2020. First baby boomer becoming 70. Second boomer becoming 50. This is the uh, age distribution in uh, 2030. First baby boomer and second baby boomer. This area of uh, you know, the top, the black area, is uh, so-called senior citizens. So there are huge you know, population to consume specialty coffee. And this is 40. Also, the average life expectancy of a Japanese people is very long. A man, 80.21 years old. Woman, 86.61 years old. So I'm very optimistic about uh, this mark, huge market for the specialty coffee in Japan. I mean, it's only about uh, specialty coffee market in Japan, we can also you know, export to another uh, countries. SCAJ members, when it was founded, it was a uh, total number was a uh, corporate 370, individual uh, 29. So total, it's, uh, it was uh, 400. But now, it's a corporate 607 and indi individual 699. So in total, 
1,306. So we grew three times in 10 years. So there is a lot of uh, interest in specialty coffee. And also, for us, the great news was that uh, Mr. Hidenori Izaki was crowned the world barista champion for the first time in SCHS history. And also, we are developing a CAGS education and certification program. I firmly believe that the specialty coffee will grow and grow very rapidly within the next 10 years in Japan. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>